Carl, the CEO of Insurance Thought Leadership. Here with me for today's panel are Nigel Wall, Head of UK Insurance, Cap Gemini Financial Services, Jeff Toe, Senior Director, Insurance Salesforce, and Donna Peoples, former Chief Customer Experience Officer at AIG. Uh, I won't go into long bios. You wouldn't be here today if you didn't already understand that these are very impressive people who know a great deal about the subject at hand. Instead, we'll include bios which we'll make available to you as soon as we're done here today. Thank you for joining us for the discussion on why basic channel integration for creating customer experiences that really resonate isn't enough to compete for today's customers, especially against new FinTech entrants. We'll not only explore how to compete for customers, but how to delight them and win their loyalty for a long, long time. If you have questions as we go along, please send them to me, and I can ask them in the flow of the conversation or at the end, assuming we have time. If we don't have time, one of the panelists or I can follow up afterwards. Uh, um, so let's get started. As you'll see in the two slides that I'll put up during this section of our discussion, customers are unhappy with their experience with insurance companies. The problem is getting worse, and it's especially acute in the U.S. Uh, Donna, let's start with you, as long as you've specialized in giving customers a great experience. What is it about the experience with insurance that upsets buyers and potential buyers and is insurance better or worse than the other industries in which you've worked? Well, hi, Paul. It's so good to be here. And hi to Jeff and Nigel and everybody out there. Um, I don't think it's a big secret, Paul, that you know insurance as a category has been a low interest, low involvement category, a lot by choice, actually. And I mean, let's face facts. Who really gets excited about buying insurance? It's just not that much fun. So, you know, how do you think about, you know, we, we come from a place where risk is our business and, and we think of claims as our product when in actuality, peace of mind is really our product. And so I'm thinking about a world where we're transforming that customer's journey and really creating value end to end so that, you know, every touch point that we have isn't a feel bad situation. It, it's it's about uh, uh, opening our eyes to the fact that, you know, we have the opportunity to enter into this customer's life at a very, very special time. You know, not that we can, not that we can solve every problem, but that we can make it just a little bit better, a little bit easier and create inflection points that bring value. So in answer to your question, you know, based on the other industries that I have worked and continue to work with, you know, being honest, I think the first step is admitting we have a problem, is that insurance is a little bit behind the curve as far as how we think about the customer from awareness all the way through advocacy. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, Jeff, customers have been indicating low levels of satisfaction with their insurers for the last few years. In fact, you have some data that shows that customers are voting with their feet, or at least their click, going elsewhere, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to, to add color to the Capgemini study that was done, uh, which showed basically, you know, dismal customer satisfaction rates in insurance, there was another study that showed that insurers are among the top 10 worst providers of customer service across all industries. So that puts them in the league, in the same league as airlines, cable companies, and credit card companies. That's pretty bad. And the stakes are pretty high for insurance. The implications are, are pretty severe. There's $400 billion in premiums across PNC and Life that um, is at stake. And that's because 70% of policyholders are making renewal decisions in the next 12 months. 40% will probably move to an, another insurer because that new insurer can provide more personalized service. And basically the implications for individual insurers is, is, you know, is, is big on two fronts. The first is you lose not just the customer for that one policy, but you lose the lifetime value of that customer. 
we know that over time, the more you can get a customer to adopt more products, the more profitable they become. So that's the first thing. You lose lifetime value of that customer. The second thing um, that insurers will suffer from when, those, when a customer leaves is brand erosion. Because in this day and age with social media and mobile and so forth, bad news travels fast. So a customer who could have been an advocate is now leaving you and probably telling his or her friends about how unhappy she was with, with your service. So absolutely, the implications are pretty, are pretty bleak um, for, for insurers. So Nigel, you've told me you think the problem will only get worse because customers are no longer just comparing insurers against each other but are comparing insurers against the greatest experiences out there, including Facebook and Amazon. Would you explain what you mean, including that wonderful term uh, you introduced me to, GAFA? Yeah, absolutely, and, and hi, everyone. Um, without question, I think, from a carrier perspective, um, from a consumer perspective, the perceived problem is going to get worse. The, the interesting thing is, is the World Insurance Report that Captain Miles has been running now every year for the last number of years in association with ESMA, um, across all continents we've seen a, a significant drop, but the most, or the biggest drop of those is being uh, north of 10% in, in the United States, which is a worry beat. And if I was um, the chief customer officer, the chief claims officer, the chief sales officer of any of these organizations, it would absolutely be an alarm bell to be saying, why is our customer experience dropping uh, year on year? And I don't think it's, are we doing anything dramatically different than we've done previously? Not necessarily. However, are we keeping pace with levels of expectation of things that we do elsewhere and compare to outside the industry? So there's not normally a single um, customer that I attend or talk to time and time again that gets compared to every other retail product or retail purchase that they make. More often than not, of course, those retail purchases that you make, they're joyful, they're delightful, they're exciting, and you want them. And to Jeff and Donna's point, um, you know, not everyone wants, to, wants this. It's seen as a grudge person, uh, purchase more often than not. So our comparisons to things that are there to extract money from consumers' wallets in a positive experience um, are getting harder and harder. And the comparison against something that you don't necessarily want in the first place means that by standing still, the perception is that our experiences are actually dropping. Um, Gaffer or Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, it's talked about time and time again. And I, you know, I, I can go into it in, in, in more detail shortly. For me, if I could describe the ideal experience for every one of us, we almost want data like uh, Google have it, supply chain like Amazon have it, have it um, a community like Facebook have, and a brand like Apple. Now, if I put all those things together, this, this whole concept of GAFA, to me, gives you the ideal framework for what a, a great experience would look like. Um, so building on what you just said about GAFA, let's get more specific about what that would look like for insurance customers. What have they come to expect or even demand from the, the companies they interact with? Let, let's keep uh, on with you, Nigel. Um, to stay ahead of the competition, what are some terms that you'd suggest that insurers could put, should put in large type on their walls and focus on day after day after day? Yeah, uh, great question. And I think if you look at the, um, the experiences that every single one of us enjoys day in, day out, when we make a purchase, let me pick on Amazon, um, and Amazon Prime specifically, I am still in awe that someone turns up on Sunday morning first thing with my package I ordered the day before, and it's just there or that afternoon. So for me, you know, the convenience of it, the, the speed at which they operate and are able to fulfill those things, apply that to the same instance in a, um, a claim scenario or a midterm adjustment that you've got to go through through a, you know, a change to your circumstances or otherwise. So, so convenience, without question, has to be um, right up near, near the top. The other one for me that I think is really important is relevance. How do we stay and remain relevant to our clients? and our consumer base time and time again, as opposed to a purchase that we do once a year or at a certain point in the year and then come back to 12 months later and forget about it. It's how do we create and remain relevant to that, that uh, customer time and time again. And they're, they're, they're two of the, the many words I'd have straight up at the top of my list. Um, as I said, each of those clients is, 
used to the pace of change. They have an easy way to change if they want to. That you know, I don't want to say customers are fickle in any way, but they have the opportunity to change if they so choose to do so. And I think the number of partners that are coming together outside of um, pure insurance now, the orchestration of the end-to-end -end experience is getting more and more exciting. The announcements day in, day out, I think the last one was with ADT and Nest as an example, about how you become relevant to your customer by doing more than just insurance. Okay. That's great. Sorry, Jeff, what words would you add? Well, speaking of key words at Dreamforce this year, um, I'm going to be talking about the five Ds of disruption. I figured I needed to one-up Nigel on his GAFA acronym. <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, one of the Ds is about dis dis disruption in distribution. And uh, distribution is about two key words. Uh, the first is seamlessness. So policyholders expect to have a connected brand experience, and this relates back to GAFA. Um, you know, they're expecting the Apple-like experience. And particularly if you're an insurer who's going direct to consumer, you want to provide that effortless experience to policyholders across all phases in their journey, whether it's in the acquisition journey, whether it's in the grow journey, whether it's in the service journey or in the renewal process. So that's the first word is seamlessness. The second word I would add is stickiness. So just like policyholders, producers, these brokers and agents, they're people just like you and me, and they have similar expectations. They expect a GAFA-like experience. And if you can provide agents and brokers with the latest product updates, support, and experts with the same ease as in a community like Facebook, you're creating loyalty and stickiness. Uh, I also just wanted to add a, a, a third word, a bonus word here, and that's integrated. And the reason why I bring this up is because oftentimes when we work with insurers, one of the barriers to reaching the world of GAFA is um, integration across the siloed processes and data. So insurers have grown through acquisitions. They've amassed um, hundreds. I've, I've worked with insurers who've got hundreds of different legacy systems, um, back office claims, policy, billing systems that they have to deal with. And you can't achieve a true single view of a customer without integrating all of these various pieces. So the third word that I would add is integrated. Um, okay, so the, those are, are great words. Donna, how would you take the concepts of speed, relevance, seamlessness, stickiness, and integrated or integration and tie all those together into a way for insurers to think about their customers? Well, first of all, let me say what Nigel said about how we think about our competition and how we're compared, absolutely true. I mean, it, we live on this big horizontal plane now where, you know, the experience that a customer or a stakeholder for that matter has with a company is compared to their last best or worst experience not to who we thought of as our competition. So uh, shout out to Nigel on that one. The, the words that I would put into your mind, Paul, are people, process, technology, and culture. And, you know, always starting with the people. We have to stop thinking about sorting data and we have to start thinking about beating hearts. There are real people behind not only the decisions that are made, but also, you know, behind every process, behind every interaction. I think as brands, we have to decide what it is we stand for. You know, I'm not even sure what world class looks like. I, I will tell you, I see everywhere pockets of brilliance that go on inside companies and insurance and other industries. But I think, you know, one of the first steps is really creating that consistent good, you know, before you hope to overcome the other obstacles that we all have as companies. You know, balancing the needs of the customer with the realities of each and every business that we're all part of, standardizing where we can, and personalizing where we should, as Jeff said. You know, it, it's been my observation, you know, we all talk about busting silos, but silos are like cockroaches. They're going to outlive us all. So, you know, how do you think about 
those verticals where we all take such good care of the customer and say we own them when in fact we're all just caregivers for a certain amount of time along that customer's journey. So, you know, the elegance or lack thereof of those handoffs is where I would also focus and, and careful to warn that while technology is great, you know, technology for technology's sake is not a good thing. So really being thoughtful and deliberate about every single step along that customer's time with us and every single interaction from the customer's perspective is, is what I would add. Okay, I'm, I'm feeling inspired. Um, <laughs> so now we're at, at the point where the rubber meets the road. So let, let's talk about what insurers have to do to prepare themselves to deliver on these things that customers are, are demanding. Um, Jeff, you and Nigel worked on a report that looked at the insurer capabilities that are needed to give customers that sort of experience. Can you start by telling us a bit about why it's not enough just to address the popular front end interfaces that touch the customer, like mobile, social, or a great website? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the popular front end interfaces just isn't good enough. Um, you could have a single pane of glass and that could be a good start at the outset but the underlying communication channels and as I mentioned before the back office data is still siloed so you know let's just take a use case if I'm a service agent or a sales agent regardless of what kind of device I'm using whether it's a desktop or a mobile device I want a single view of that policyholder that pulls together things like claims history policy changes interaction history, um, and I want all of that in addition to policy ho uh, policyholder profile information. So that profile information may also include things like household, you know, who are the key members. Um, if, if I'm a life provider, um, you know, it's, it's important to me to know who the spouse and the children are because they, they could be potential dependents or beneficiaries, right? So tying all these pieces together requires more than just a unified front-end user experience. You need to actually unify the underlying pieces, right? And the second key takeaway um, that I want to leave you with is that it's not just about um, having a view or access to the, to the data. It's also about being able to perform analytics on that data. So it's not just viewing it, but it's what you do with the data. And you know, the question that insurers need to ask themselves um, if they want to take it beyond just single pane of glass is how are you going to run your business rules and drive next fast action on the data that you have if you don't have that integration that's happening underneath that single pane of glass? Okay. Uh, Nigel, you highlighted seven capabilities in the report that have a direct impact on improving customer experience and that are important for insurers to tackle. Um, given that we don't have a, an unlimited amount of time, how, how about if you talk about the three areas that you found were especially important and most problematic for insurers? Sure. I think a, a good segue on, on the back of what Jeff was, was talking about. Uh, the, the, the ace of spades, as you see in front of you, and actually, you mentioned it's for insurance, but equally this, this um, model is, is replicable in, in almost any industry. We obviously have to change the, the core capabilities inside them, but the seven categories are pretty consistent uh, across multiple industries, which is nice because it gives us the ability to compare how we're doing against A, other industries, and B, where we actually want to get to. So you'll see the seven, excuse me, the seven things in front of you. Um, the three that I'd pick out, and again on the back of what Jeff was saying, are connecting elegantly, engaging regularly, and seeing completely. And what I mean by, by each of these, I'll give you some, a, couple, a couple of examples of these. Um, I can't believe I'm saying it 10 years on or 15 years on from when I first saw it, but seeing completely, actually understanding what our customers have, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I can probably feel some smiles at the end of the webinar if I, if I said that most organizations I speak to don't necessarily have a full view of the number of products or the interaction points that each of their customers, uh, brokers, agents, or otherwise have with, the, have with their customers. And it's, it amazes me in this day and age that we haven't got to the point. It's absolutely possible. We haven't been able to exercise it fully about how we bring all those things back to that single pane of glass that, 
that Jeff talked to. So getting that single view and moving, using some of that insight and data that we can then um, take from our customer base to drive an increased share of you know, number of products per customer that we may have will give us the ability to do a lot more with the clients that we have, as well as identifying cool things like um, what, where are the product niches that we need to pick up on that will drive better relevance for our client, back to the word I mentioned earlier. So seeing completely for me is absolutely critical. It's both the start of the process and it's the end of the process. It's no coincidence that this is sitting underpinning every other one of the other things that you see on the uh, ace in front of you. This is absolutely uh, key to driving everything else that we do. The two other ones I talked about were engaging regularly. And this is, a, this is actually a tough challenge for insurance organizations because ultimately, you know, I think as Donna said, why do I want to talk to my insurance provider unless it's a time of crisis, I, have had a, I need to make a claim, therefore let's make sure it's as uh, smooth and swift and that moment the truth is as great as possible, or I'm doing an adjustment, or I'm doing a cancellation, or I'm going to do a renewal. There's no real great experiences that you're going to call up and say, I'd like to do X, Y, or Z. Um, and, make, and make it interesting and exciting for the, to the end user. So for us, the engaging regularly in a way that's relevant for them, I think is coming more and more important. Back to some of the things I mentioned earlier about the, the, the way in which we're going to start interacting with our clients and the advent of everything that's connected out there. So there's some great examples that we talked to from you know, the, the connected car, the connected home, the connected self, um, where we can actually drive and elegantly, uh, sorry, or a, sorry, regularly engage with each of our individuals that we that we want to market to and uh, talk to. So for that, that's that's really really key. It also means we don't necessarily want to digitize a standard or manual process today. We really have to look at the end-to-end -end business model and say, just because it got sent out as a letter in the old world, by sending that out as, as an email with a PDF attachment, that really isn't necessarily. Um, making it as elegant as it should be, which brings you on to the, the, the last point I talk about, which is connecting elegantly. There's lots of great things out there. There's lots of great channels and, and ways in which we can talk to people. It goes back to, to relevance. We've done some other work where um, the millennial generation, for example, where we all think they want to interact over Facebook or Twitter or other social channels that are out there. The reality is they want to connect in a way that best suits their experience. And millennials, for example, want to connect in a way that says, we actually have no clue what we've bought, and we're, we're worried about what we've bought, therefore can we speak to someone that's going to give me the assurance and confidence that they walk me through a certain process. So connecting elegantly isn't necessarily just about digital or multi-channel or otherwise, it's about being able to support them across all of those things in a way that suits that business going forward. So those are just a couple of the examples that we can talk about for those three. And, and of course, insurance has uh, more of a problem than a lot of industries do, just because uh, good insurers will connect directly with customers, but then also do an awful lot through the agent channel. Uh, whereas Apple can deal say, directly with me when it tells me a watch or, or whatever. Uh, so that, that seems to me anyway does to really complicate the issue for a lot of insurers. Um, so Donna, to, to make those issues uh, uh, concrete, as long as you're the person who was responsible for delivering a great experience, despite whatever limitations there were with the technology, w would you tell us what it's like to struggle uh, without the technology uh, being quite up to the task? Yeah, um, Paul, and uh, you know, I, I kind of go back always to the people, and for anybody out there who hasn't done this as an exercise, I, I've really encourage you to do it and I had the opportunity with a lot of different companies I've worked with to sit in the call centers and you know it's always ironic to me that you know the the call center folks while generally not always but generally they're some of the lowest compensated maybe some of the least trained still represent the brand every single day as surely as the senior executives when they're speaking on analyst calls or, or to the street. And, you know, those people are really where the rubber hits the road. So if you haven't gone out and, you know, stood in the retail uh, locations and seen the interactions, if you haven't sat at the call or processing centers, you know, these are the warriors of your brand and of your company. And 
um, there was a study that was conducted uh, around call centers that in 2013, the average number of screens that a CSR would have to pull up to get to what you and I as a customer would think is a relatively simple answer was five screens on average. That number jumped in 2014 to seven. And I will tell you, I have seen that firsthand. And so, you know, those user experiences inside the company have everything to do with the translation and service delivery to our customers. I, I would just, I would encourage uh, just very thoughtful process around connecting those systems. We all live with, you know, vestiges of legacy systems that don't talk to each other and and struggle with that every day. But solving for that problem, especially as as Jeff and Nigel have said, where you know the world has changed and we lived and we live in the stakeholder universe. You know, that starts in my mind with the employee at the center, but goes all the way out to the outer reaches where the general public is concerned and has a huge influence over our success or failure. You know, really recognizing that we no longer have the benefit and control of a monologue at the customers or our stakeholders. We have to have a real-time two-way dialogue with them and we have to be consistent in what we say because it's no longer word of mouth. It's a world of mouth out there as Nigel said. So I would just say, you know, in, in the mix of all the technology, all the possibilities, keep in mind that, you know, we talk a lot about the customer's journey, but there's also equally as important an employee journey that creates this double helix that is the corporate DNA. And how those things are sorted and connected, I think is so critical with systems and technology really being at the center if it's done the right way of connecting those two worlds. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll summarize just for a second here because I, I think the, the points you guys are on are so important. Um, you, you're, you're talking about how the world has changed and how insurers really need to adapt to provide this great experience, but even before they can get to the point of, of starting to deliver on that vision, they have to do an awful lot to tackle major issues with their legacy systems. So the, the, the question I guess I'd pose is how do we get there from here? Um, Nigel, it isn't possible obviously to get into the whole roadmap, but how would you tell people to get started as they think about tackling these uh, uh, major issues that they have to solve with these systems so that the, the poor folks in the call center don't need to run all over the place, tracking down little bits of uh, data here and there. Yeah, I think it's an age-old problem, and as Donna Don described it, I've sat in those call centers, I've worked in those call centers, I've seen it firsthand. We're also, every one of us as consumer, every one of us has bought this, has interacted. I often think that we, we approach these things the wrong way, or it's the wrong way if, if you're a uh, client sometimes. We often approach these inside the organization as inside out, let's go fix our stuff and then bring it back to the customers. The other, school of of, of, the other school of thought, of course, is looking at it outside in and thinking there as a customer agent or an employee and working out what it is the process I go through. So by linking the back-end applications to the front-end channels or ways in which you want to get those across each of the facets of the uh, life cycle, be it distribution, marketing, claims, service or otherwise, we shouldn't, we should, back to relevance, we shouldn't be applying the broad brush one size fits all because how you interact in a claim versus a service versus a, a sales scenario should be very, very different. It should also be relevant and contextual to the individual based on what they're up to. So if it's someone who's just bought a policy um, and is calling three or six months later, um, it's likely to be because of one of X number of reasons. Let's make sure we make it as easy and simple as possible. Equally, it's not as straightforward as applying a, you know, a piece of technology across the whole lot and giving access to old legacy-based systems that were built to provide annualized or other, other statements that you know, give you a transactional view of the world. It's, it's marrying transactional, interactional, and context together to give you an, an ideal scenario. So where to start really is, is to, for me, without question, is to think like the customer, think like the person you're trying to interact with, and the scenario which they're, they're operating within, and use that to then drive the conversations 
it doesn't mean to say it needs to be huge or otherwise. You can actually break it down to some quite um, interesting, quick wins. And we've got some clients that launch products in 30 to 40 days. And when I say that to most people, they, they, all, they often fall off their chair because the usual cycle for doing things like this is, you know, 6, 12, 18 months long. But the ability to, to use some of the, the modern technology that's out there to join the dots, albeit virtually, and make life easy allows you to test it and understand if it works properly, you need to tweak it or it's going to fail. But at least you can try it, prove it, and either move it into a, a fully productionized and roll it out en masse or move on to a different thing. So for us, there's a, there's a whole host of ways in which you can start to meet those expectations in the way customers which want to be served against either their channel, their type, their style, against the type of activity that, you, that they're talking about. Okay. Uh, Donna, what would you tell people to do first to become customer-centric when they get to the office tomorrow morning? We've already talked about uh, uh, hanging out in the, in the call center. Uh, yeah. would, would that be it or would it be something else? No, I would say, you know, very broadly to think about really four things, and, and that is we talked about embracing this new model that we all live on this horizontal, um, that we, we need to be aware, we need to listen to our customers, uh, you know, get out of our focus group of one, out of our own head. Um, we also need to engage employees and, you know, I think, um, you know, creating also finally this, you know, one version of the truth. I, I mean, it's it's been my experience that, you know, you have to understand your numbers. And by that, I mean, you know, you have to have agreement by the senior team on where it is you're starting as a baseline. You know, you, you can create benchmarks later, but unless you have that common understanding and agreement of where you're starting from, there's no way that you're going to be able to measure the impact and tell a compelling story to the rest of the organization so that, you know, everybody adheres to that vision. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what, what would you add? Yeah, I, you know, um, I would say that when you get back into your office tomorrow, um, before we even talk about what you should do, let's just kind of figure out what we're aspiring to have. And there are two things to keep in mind. Um, the first is that you need to have a system of engagement layer. Um, you need to have that layer that unifies the back office data with interaction histories and life events of policyholders, right? So that at the end of the day, we want to be able to target more relevant offers to policyholders. We want to be able to um, target better product information and support to producers based on the, the, their demonstrated strengths in the marketplace. So you need to have that system of engagement layer. That's the first thing that we aspire to, right? The second is to have an agility layer. And one of the reasons why cloud-enabled solutions are gaining traction in the insurance um, industry is because the agility layer or, or, or the cloud offers speed to market and open APIs to surface data to use cases that are being demanded by the business and by policyholders and agents. So, you know, with these two things in mind, tomorrow when you get back into the office, um, there are four things that I would say you need to do. Number one is don't pave the cow path. Don't pave the cow path. Now, Nigel alluded to this earlier, right? Um, there's a difference between business processes and customer agent experiences. Business processes are things that you could predefine. They involve compli complicated workflows, um, say in a process of providing a, you know, a, a, a quote to a customer, right? But customer and agent experiences are, are much more fluid. Um, they interact in a variety of ways in a non-sequential manner across various channels and across various products. So it simply will not work to turn to the predefined business process maps that you've done in the past, perhaps decades ago. Don't turn to those. Think first about the customer and agent experience, what their goals are, and design the customer experience around those goals. So number one, don't pave the cow path. Number two, rationalize. 
as we had talked about earlier, um, Donna had talked about it, Nigel, as, as well as myself, you know, um, legacy systems and these silos are a major barrier to moving forward and maturing our ability to, um, as, we, as we call it, providing the elegant customer experience and doing it elegantly. So make those tough decisions. Rationalize. Make those tough, tough decisions about what systems that you have in your spaghetti factory of legacy systems, which one of them are strategic and which ones are, go are you going to sunset. Make those tough choices and figure out what you're going to replace it with, right? Are you going to build it, right? And who, who are you going to partner with? So number two is rationalize. The third thing that you would do in the morning is unify. So before you could even take the first few steps towards actually deploying or designing, you need to get basic blocking and tackling stuff done, like governance, like having a common data model in place so that everyone agrees on what the data is, how it's defined, and where it's going to come from, right? And you also need to unify not just at the data level, but also, as I, I talked about before, as you redesign that customer and agent experience, you got to get the executive level sponsors on board as well as the process processors, right? The people who are actually performing the work in these contact centers. So it's unify, unify the vision across the various levels in the organization. That's number three. And then number four, um, Donna had actually alluded to this. You want to be able to measure your results. Think about the KPIs, the key performance indicators. Donna had talked about establishing that baseline. I would also add that you want to be able to tie business outcomes and key performance indicators to your action. So whatever use case you're defining on your roadmap or whatever initiative you have, you're going to need a business case to green light that and get the funding to move forward. But you're also going to need to be able to say at the end of the deployment and after we've let it run for a little while, have we met our objectives? So these are the four things. Don't pave the cow path, rationalize, unify, and measure. Okay, that, that's, that's um, great advice. So let's talk for a second about what it looks like when an insurer gets the customer experience right. I mean, that's, that's obviously the, uh, the payoff, even though, as you guys have said, as we've talked about this, that it's important to note that the, the work is really never done. I mean, you, you can make great progress and, uh, and win for a while, uh, but you have to keep going to, uh, to make sure you continue to uh, delight the customer. So, Jeff, maybe you could talk a little bit to this slide, uh, and, uh, and then, Nigel, I guess I'd like to ask you to talk to the next one uh, and tell a, a success story, maybe based on something that you and Salesforce have done together so we get a sense of how great things can be when uh, when things do go right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so this particular slide is really about recognizing that you can't just flip the light switch and then overnight, you know, w w uh, the insurer reaches a transformational stage, right, that fourth phase there. Instead, um, you need to take sort of a crawl, walk, run strategy where you're laying down the foundation that provides the ability to deliver on the subsequent phases of automating your processes and optimizing them, right? So in our view, the roadmap to the future is just, again, in the first phase, laying down the foundation, really um, getting to know your customer through single view, right, of that customer or the agent, right, their interactions, claims history, policy information. And the way you do that is to think about how you're going to integrate your core back office systems. And it's not just integrating across the core systems, but also across channels. Because as I mentioned before, that policy holder and even your agents are going to be interacting with you through a variety of different channels as well as through a variety of uh, different products. So you want to lay that foundation. In the second phase, uh, you want to really focus on providing contextual information. So now that you've personalized, you're reaching sort of a personalized experience in the foundational phase. In the second one, you want to provide context 
And by that I mean, you know, when, when we walk these contact centers and we look at the way um, service agents and sales agents are interacting with the system, you know, oftentimes they have to do a lot of swivel chair integration just to know, well, what they're dealing with. What is the context? Who's the customer I'm talking to? What is the product they're interested in? Um, what was their last interaction? Am I going to make that customer repeat the same kind of information? And that swivel chair integration is a it requires a lot of manual reconciliation across different systems. And so what we want to do is provide all of this through a unified view, but also have the underlying integrations in place. Right, so that they can provide a targeted offer um, to, to the policyholder. The third is around optimization, and this is really about <clears throat> optimizing not just the service process or, say, the sales process per se, but how marketing integrates with the sales process and how the sales process ties in with the service process and integrating and optimizing across these three key functions. Right, and then on top of that, um, providing an analytics layer in order to perform the right kinds of um, decision making that you want to make across these three functions again of marketing, sales, and service. And so by doing that, um, what you do is you provide the ability to listen for opportunities, things like life events, right? We just um, were, we're working with an insurer, and they were talking about the various kinds of life events that trigger conversations or opportunities for cross-sell or follow-through on leads. These could be things like, you know, being near tax season or a, a child just graduated or someone just changed their jobs. All of these things represent opportunities to create a conversation and to cross-sell. And so you're not going to achieve that without having that integration, again, across marketing, service, sales, and analytics. And then finally, the fourth thing, you know, we, we alluded to this earlier, but, you know, believe it or not, there's a lot of insurers who are doing some really amazing stuff out there. Um, for example, around usage-based insurance. So things like Internet of Things and, uh, you know, one insurer is providing fit to policyholders so that, um, you know, based on their lifestyles, uh, the, the insurer is able to provide the appropriate discounts and their policies. And you're not going to get to do fancy stuff like that until you've done all of the foundational work in the phases that precede that, right? Um, and the other thing that um, you want to try to accomplish when you're transformational is also to be very proactive in, your, in, in, the, in servicing that policyholder or that agent so that before um, problems even arise, you're so in tune with where that policyholder is in their interactions with you or in the life events that you are able to actually provide value-adding services and information before it even has to be um, uh, requested. So these are the four phases in the roadmap. And, and um, again, you, know, you don't get to the transformational state without actually working on your basic blocking and tackling foundational stuff. Right. Nigel, could you take us to the next step and uh, talk about this slide with sort of the, the results, but not just in terms of the numbers, uh, also in terms of the kind of experience that uh, you have had when you have, um, uh, have done one of these sort of transformational projects at a client? Yeah, absolutely. And one of, one of my favorite phase, phrases is think big, start small, act quickly. And I think that, that beautifully surmises the one through four phases that Jeff's just talked to. The thing big part for me is just to understand what is it we're trying to tackle in the first place. What, what is it we're after? And you'll see some of the numbers at the bottom that we, we have here. Is it you know, lead volume? Is it upsell, cross-sell? Is it service? Is it retention? The thinking big part is all about understanding and being crystal clear on that vision. Why are we doing this in the first place? Back to what we said earlier, and, you know, um, let, let's not forget the the absolute business strategy that we're trying to achieve in the first place here. So the think big piece is, is having that vision. The start small means that I could pick any single one of these uh, areas in isolation and use those as a specific uh, use case. I can break it down to an individual department of an organization. I could break it down to a line of business. I could break it down to a segment. 
um, and actually really focus in and say, actually, for this segment, I want to do increased upsell cross sell. I'm a motor insurer that wants to do uh, better retention, for example, or I'm a, a composite insurer that wants to do overall better customer service uh, and retention. And the, the things here, I mean, there's some, there's some great, great, great numbers. This is just a small percentage or small uh, selection of some of the things that we've done. I can give you a whole host of things that uh, that clients are working with us on right now. The cross sell upsell is a constant uh, constant challenge. Most companies that I, I work with right now have a have an average of one to one point one products per customer. Best in class, we tell you that it's probably three products per customer. So what's the route from one or one point one to three? And getting that increase in cross sell and upsell goes back to the things that we talked about earlier, and that's you know understanding. Um, the customer giving you full insight to things, engaging regularly and connecting elegantly. So all those things come back to come back to full circle to say actually if we can get these things right, the the prize is worth it if we if we're going to go chase these things. Um, so that's cross sell upsell. Uh, lead volume again is is how we can turn this from a reactive world to a to a proactive world. There's one thing that I love about insurance is that it's it's almost certain. We always, we always, we always want it. We know we're going to have to renew in, in almost um, all cases. How do we get there before they actually come to us in the first place? And using that data and the ability to engage regularly, we have the ability to be much, much smarter than we're doing with it right now. The flip side of that is customers might think we're being too smart and um, be scared of the, the, I don't want to say big data, but be scared of the big brother type scenario that, that are possible. And, and believe me, it's absolutely possible to do some crazy things out there that will drive some, um, some brilliant, uh, not just cross sell upsell, but lead volume increase uh, and so much more. So there's, there's some great clients that we're working with out there. We work with them from departmental level where they're going to fix a specific issue that's overall back to the, 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 the big vision, but they're starting quickly. All the way through to the end-to-end -end transformational clients that are saying, we're going to work outside in and we're going to transform our customer journey so that they, it truly is a customer journey. And when they call up, we call them Nigel as opposed to what's your product or policy number. So we're moving very much from a product-centric and policy-centric world to a customer-centric world that allows us to uh, spread our wings with the clients and, and, and get much more um, engaged with them. Yeah, the, this is, this is um, such a great point, Nigel. And I want to crystallize some of your points. Um, in the context of a real life case study, uh, one which you and I had worked on um, together with a multi-line insurer. Um, this, this particular insurer, um, was their vision was to create a, what they called an interaction management platform um, for three key things. The first was for the policyholders. So uh, a key area of focus was the customer experience. The second was the agent experience. And then the third, um, and Donna had alluded to the importance of call centers, um, the third area that they were focused on was the contact centers, right? And this was a contact center that had 4,000 um, um, agents. And when, we, when they started with the customer experience, they were interested in expanding customer self-service across various phases of quoting, policy, claims, um, service, uh, claims requests, payments, um, updating profiles. And so, you know, one of the things that allowed them to do this was to provide a, what they called a customer 360 data hub, right? And so this goes back to um, some of the things that we, talk, we talked about earlier around laying down the foundation, right? The foundation of an engagement layer. And what they've seen in terms of the, the uh, business value is that the increased personalization of the experience and the self-service resulted in increases in net promoter scores um, while reducing operating costs, right? Because what was happening is um, it was resulting in a lot of call deflection. Um, and so customers were able to just serve themselves rather than picking up the phone and burden, um, becoming a burden to the contact centers. And the second area around agent experience, um, this was a community of 45,000 um, users and they wanted the ability to support agents as they manage policies in force. They wanted to improve agent productivity to give them the ability to handle new business 
and to track retention. And they wanted to do this through an agency dashboard um, that could handle um, your basic blocking and tackling CRM capabilities, right? But in, in addition to that, quoting the policy admin and a uh, single view of customer, and to be able to provide alerts, news bulletins, help desk, things of that nature, right? And then again, that's resulted in NPS scores increasing for the agents. And then finally, around the contact center, as I'd mentioned earlier, 4,000 agents. This was not just about the phone, but it was also about managing the omni-channel interactions with the customers, whether it be through social media or through uh, calls. And what this allowed them to do was not only um, be able to handle these interactions at scale, but it enabled the agents and the CSRs to collaborate and, and, and to handle handoffs of cases between employees within the contact centers and in the, in the back office in a more streamlined fashion. So this is an excellent story that we often turn to as a model for um, this kind of um, business value that you see here in this chart. Okay. Um, so Donna, we'll give you the last word on, on this one. Uh, you described the frustrations that come when technology isn't up to the task. From your standpoint as the, the chief customer experience officer, what did it look like for customers when the technology was up to the task? Or what could it look like? So Paul, you're talking about Nirvana, right? <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, exactly. So seriously, you know, for every company, for every business in every industry, I think the ability to design an end-to-end -end experience that's easy, that's memorable, and that's successful for the customer, and to do it consistently is nirvana. That's the key. But, you know, let's be honest here, as Jeff and Nigel have spoken and, and myself as well, you know, the metrics are important. So, you know, we talk about hearts and minds, but it's really about hearts, minds, and wallets, after all. And, you know, our ability to retain customers, to increase share of wallet, and to attract the best, most profitable customers is really what we're after here. So, you know, I mean, it clearly, you know, by the numbers, 55% of our customers tell us that they would pay more for guaranteed better service. And 82% of our customers would buy more from us if we just made it easier for them. And 89% of our customers said that they would quit doing business with us after a bad experience. So, you know, keeping in mind, you know, that Customer retention, just 2% is equal to a 10% reduction in our expenses is huge. You know, why shouldn't we as companies focus on the top line? You know, we can control the middle line by creating more consistency, by applying better technology and improving along the way. There's no silver bullets. You know, if there were, we would have all figured it out a long time ago. But I think always remembering that, you know, satisfaction isn't enough. It's about the loyalty of our customers and growing that customer base that's going to be so important to us all going forward. I love that line. Hearts, minds, and wallets. Uh, words to live by. <laughs> you can quote me on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, I may or may not attribute it to you. That's sort of the way journalists are. <laughs> um, so we will not, in fact, have time for questions. We just have a, a few minutes left here. Um, uh, to me, there's been an awful lot of material uh, that I think is great. I'm actually going to follow up with a summary via an article on the website here in the next uh, a couple of days because I think there are so many good points to draw out. But um, why don't I ask you three um, to just summarize quickly, take a, just a minute or two, and say what you hope folks will take away from this and, uh, and start applying in their businesses, uh, maybe even yet this afternoon. Um, uh, Nigel, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thank, thanks, Paul. Um, I guess for me, I go back to the two words that I, that I mentioned earlier, and that's relevance and convenience. Um, they're relatively long words in themselves, and I think if we can make sure that we maintain relevance to our clients time and time again, especially as this continued connected world evolves, 
we have a massive opportunity in insurance to be part of it. If we fail to do that, I think we can quickly become irrelevant and have a very different conversation and that customer experience point is picked up with by the car itself, the home or whatever's controlling that, um, the health plan or otherwise. So being relevant um, is absolutely critical. Uh, I think we need to evolve with, with those partnerships and, and, and as those orchestrations change. I think that will be thick and fast over the coming months and years. Um, and finally, convenience. It's an age-old saying, but we've got to be easy to do business with. And you, you saw at the outset the 10% drop in the US, a 10.5% drop. It's dropping for a reason, not because we're getting any worse at what we're doing. It's because everyone else is making it as easy as possible, and the expectation in that bar is rising time and time again. So we've got to make sure we stay on the right side of that bar to make sure that we continue to be um, a convenience for our customers um, and easy to do business with. So that's my two. Okay. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, so Nigel ended with two nouns. I'm going to end with verbs. <laughs> um, the, the first verb is don't pave the cow path. I've got to just reiterate that. Um, don't, don't turn to your old business processes and old ways of doing things and really think about how you're going to reinvent the customer experience from that customer and agent's perspective. So that's number one. Um, number two, it's about rationalizing. Um, and I'm just going back to the four verbs I used earlier. Rationalize and figure out, make those tough decisions. Figure out what you're going to sunset and when you, what you're going to keep um, as strategic. Um, and then unify and measure. I mean, we, I've talked about those earlier. So those are the two verbs. And I would also just want to add that, um, you know, think about what you want to aspire to. And then the, the, the two key principles of doing, um, you know, improving customer experiences around, number one, having that engagement platform. Have that engagement platform. And then number two, have an agility layer so that you can make it happen with quick time to market. These are the two final thoughts, engagement platform and agility layer. Okay, so Donna, they've taken the nouns and the verbs. I don't know if that leaves you with the adjectives or the adverbs or conjunctions, but uh, how would you summarize? You know, I have, um, I have this incredible urge to diagram a sentence after all this. <laughs> but um, but I would just say I, I think it's really important, you know, in in the bigger context to to stop thinking about transactions and start thinking about relationships, and whether they're customers or they're employees or they're part of the bigger universe of stakeholders, including the intermediaries and the legislators and the regulators, you know, it, it's about the people. And, and always keep the people, you know, in, in mind. Um, be data informed and technology enabled, but always think about the people. Okay. Um, so I, I, I think this was, was great. I hope uh, the folks listening to us uh, agree. Um, I'm now trying to put up a slide that will show you how to. Uh, uh, to get in touch with us, and my computer is not cooperating. Um, but we will follow up with an email that will um, uh, provide a link to the webinar uh, so that you can share it with folks. Um, we also will provide the slides. Uh, we would encourage you to contact uh, any of the, the panelists or me if you have any uh, follow-up questions. And as I said, I, I will also summarize all this because uh, I thought there were so many good nuggets in something that I'll post on the website here in the next day or so. So um, uh, thank you to everybody. I hope it was uh, uh, as useful for folks listening as, as it was for me. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.